Welcome to Zoo Town Church. We're glad you're here. Looking for more ways to stay connected with the zoo? Download the app. You can find it on any Windows, Apple, or Android device. On the app, you can view past sermons and share the content directly to your social media. This is a great way to help preach the gospel to Missoula and beyond. If you can't make it to a service, you can also watch live stream directly on your phone. Make sure to check out all the extra content as well, like the Year of the Word reading plan and the interactive notes. Interactive notes are actually prepared by the pastors for their individual sermons. You can also add your own notes into the mix. So head over to the App Store, download the app, and we hope you enjoy the message. If you have your Bibles here tonight, you can grab them and you can open them up to the book of Mark chapter 4 is where we're going to be spending most of the night. Uh, if you don't have your Bibles with you tonight, that's all right. We try to put all the scripture we use up on the screen uh, or you can use uh, a Bible app on your phone if you'd like to. Uh, but we do encourage you to bring your Bibles. There's just something special about having your own Bible, being able to underline and highlight and, and circle and write notes in, in your Bibles. So we encourage you to bring it. We encourage you to take notes. Uh, you are here by elective. Uh, as far as I know, no one made you be here tonight. So we encourage you to lean in, be expectant, get the most out of this as you can. We believe that coming to church is not just to fulfill some religious duty to make you feel good about yourself. This is actually an opportunity where we get to commune with God. We get to interact with Jesus. We get to grow. We get to learn. And so we encourage you, whatever it means for you, to lean in, be attentive. You can even nod your head if you like something. You can elbow the person next to you if what I'm saying is for them. Just let him know he's talking to you tonight. Uh, whatever it means for you to be engaged, encourage you uh, to be engaged. Uh, we're going to go to Mark chapter 4. And uh, we're looking at a story uh, of Jesus. We're, we're consistently downtown. We've been looking through the life of Jesus because we believe that the more that we see Jesus, the more our faith is going to grow and it's going to mature. We'll have greater influence. We'll have greater purpose. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12 uh, talks to us about that the more we have our eyes fixed on Jesus, uh, that our faith won't just begin, but it will grow and it will mature. That it, the more we look at Jesus, we'll find sin falling by the wayside. We'll find the weight of religion falling off of us and we will affect live out our purpose on this earth. Uh, if you are new to Zootown, it is our desire to not just live our lives uh, and, and then die having a faith in Jesus, but we want to live our lives to the fullest. We want to have maximum influence, uh, maximum purpose. And so if you are new here or you've been here for a while, I want to remind you that we are not here just to feel good about ourselves. We are here on a mission. We are here with purpose, that there is a, a, a purpose, there is influence for your life. And we find ourselves living out that purpose most effectively when we're consistently living looking at the character of Jesus, the love of Jesus, the gospel of Jesus. And so tonight we're going to look at one more story of Jesus. And uh, my hope and my prayer is not that you just get more information or you learn more about a story in the Bible, but that when you leave here tonight, you've got a greater picture of who Jesus is, a greater understanding of his love and his grace. Because if you see Jesus, it is going to fuel you to live out your purpose. It's going to fuel you to live a life not go going back to sin and not living under the weight of religion. So let's look at the story. We're going to look at Mark chapter chapter 4. Uh, we're going to pick up in verse 35. A little bit of context here. This has been a, a very long day for Jesus. This has been a, a long day for his disciples. If you look earlier uh, in the chapter or even the chapter before, uh, Jesus starts off the day with this, this heated interaction with some of the religious leaders accusing him of being uh, the prince of demons. Like a, he's got this, this heavy weighted debate. All these crowds are gathering. We see him have this super extensive teaching. He gives all these different parables or illustrations of what the kingdom of God is like. Uh, he's, he's had a long day. He just got done teaching from a boat. And now we pick up at the end of the day as, as evening is setting in. It says this in verse 30. As evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross to the other side of the lake. So they took Jesus in the boat and they started out leaving the crowds behind, although other boats followed. But soon a fierce storm came up. High waves were breaking into the boat and it began to fill with water. Jesus was sleeping in the back of the boat uh, full disclosure here, I was studying a different translation earlier uh, in the week, and it said that he fell asleep in the stern. And I was like, I have no idea what a stern is. Thank God for the New Living Translation. The stern is the back of the boat. Uh, I need that. I'm not real nautical. Uh, who here actually knew what a stern was? All right. oh, there's a few of you. What's the, what's, Andrew knows everything. Uh, what's the front of the boat called? The bow. And are there names for the sides? 
The side, left side, right side. You nailed it. What, what are they? Port? What's port? What side's port? <laughs> Pages of, I don't know. And, and starboard? Starboy? Star what? Poop deck. All right, whatever they said. Jesus is in the stern, on the stern, the back of the boat. For, for those of you who need, it's simple. Thank God for the NLT. He's on the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. I love that detail. Jesus found himself a pillow while he's traveling. He's the guy in the airport with the neck pillow around his neck. Like, I don't care what you think. I'm traveling comfortably. I'm going to find some sleep. Jesus has a cushion. Says the disciples woke him up shouting, Teacher, don't you care that we are going to drown? When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and he said to the waves, Silence, be still. Suddenly the wind stopped and there was a great calm. Then he asked them, Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? The disciples were absolutely terrified. Who is this man? They asked each other. Even the wind and the waves obey him. Who is this man that even the wind and the waves obey? Great song lyrics, if you ask me. Uh, we, we actually used the Bible in writing that song. It was wonderful. We're going to look at this story tonight of, of this storm that these disciples assumed that they were going to, to die in and Jesus' response to their cries. Perhaps tonight you're in a storm of sorts. You look at your life, whether it's health, relationships, finances, decisions, but you find yourself in, in a storm. We're going to make some observations tonight of what Jesus does, what his personality, what his character, what his response is when he sees his followers in the midst of a storm. And I believe that tonight uh, Jesus is going to speak to your life. I believe with all my heart that no, none of you are here by accident. You didn't surprise God when you showed up. Uh, some of you, you're here faithfully and consistently, and God has continued to build and grow your faith. We're so glad that you're here. Some of you, you haven't been here for a long time, or tonight's even your first night. I want to tell you, it was no accident. That what God wants to speak to you through his word is not just something that, that I decided to come up with, but I believe that God wants to speak to you powerfully tonight. And my prayer is that you would be impressed with Jesus tonight. That it's not about a church, it's not about a setting, it's not about a song, it's not about a speaker, it's about Jesus. And my prayer is that we leave here and you just have this, this awe of who Jesus is, his love and his grace for you. Would you bow your heads, pray with me, and we're going to make some observations about the storm. Jesus, love you. I thank you so much for your word. I thank you so much that we have the privilege of seeing your character. I thank you that you sent Jesus to this earth to be the full representation of who you are, the way that you interact with humanity. Lord, I pray that tonight we would see the goodness and the grace and the love of Jesus. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would speak to every heart, that you would use the words that you've, you've put on my mind and on these pages uh, to do what only you can do, that you would actually impact people's hearts and lives. Lord, you know who tonight needs to be encouraged, who needs to be challenged, and Lord, do what you want to do in each and every heart. I pray that our hearts would be open, receptive. Father, I pray for my, even myself that you would challenge me, that you would, you would speak to, to where my life needs to grow and my faith needs to grow. Uh, we love you. We're so grateful to be together in this place tonight. We're so grateful for your word. It's in your name we're gathered. It's your name that we pray. And Zootown said, Amen. Zootown said, Amen. 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 As I read this story, we see Jesus gets awoken from a deep sleep. And I can't read this story without thinking about, uh, uh, about waking people up in a deep sleep. Uh, most specifically, I had a lot of different stories I kind of wanted to tell tonight. Uh, but when I was in, in high school, whenever uh, I was out late, whether it was just hanging out at a friend's house or at a sports, sporting event, whatever, whenever I came home, the, the rule with my parents was that when I got home, uh, I needed to go into their room, wake them up, and let them know that I made it home safe. And uh, we, this was before the days of text messaging. Like, I had to actually go physically tell mom and dad, I'm home, I'm alive, I'm safe. Uh, but this always caused great fear in me. Not because I was afraid to tell them what time I got home or what I did that night, but because of whenever I woke my mom up, she woke up in a panic. She would scream and she would jump. And, and we learned to develop this 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 fear of waking up mom. But she told us every time, you have to wake me up. I need to know that you're home safe. So we'd go in and she would always just scream and jump and it would terrify us. Like she thought she was
was scared, but she scared us worse. And so we go in and, and like kind of, kind of nudge and back away and try to like make this, this as simple as possible. Like, Mom, Mom, I'm home. And, and she just wouldn't move and be like, Mom, Mom, I'm home. And as soon as she... And my dad's name is Russ. He's like, Russell, get the guns! And like, and someone's here! And he was like, Mom, it's me, it's me. I'm home safe. Well, why did you scare me? I was like, you, you made me wake you up. And every time, I almost die because you, you, you scare me so bad. And, and so we try to like go, just wake up Dad and not Mom. So we wake up Dad and try to be real quiet. We're like, Dad, I'm home. He's like, awesome. Did you tell your mom? I was like, no, I did not tell Mom. You know what happens when I tell Mom. He's like, no, you need to tell Mom. I was like, you need to tell Mom. You do it. And we would just be arguing back and forth. And, and she would hear. She's like, who's here? Who's here? It's like, it's your son. I, it's me again. I always come and tell you because she, she would just freak out whenever we went in to, to wake her up and uh, it caused terror inside of me. And, and I just, I read the story and I consider Jesus in this deep, deep sleep and he gets awoken and, and he has these disciples who they come to this place where they know that as much as they're going through in life and in the storm and in their boat, that they are put in a place where they have to wake Jesus up. The things are out of their hands, out of their control, and they need to wake Jesus up. We, we pick up in the story again in verse 35. It says, the evening has come after this long day, and Jesus says to his disciples, this is Jesus' thought, Jesus' idea. He says, let's get in this boat and let's cross to the other side of the lake. They're at the Sea of Galilee, and this is a, about a five-mile journey that they're going to have to take, and, and night is falling. It's, it's getting dark, and they have to, they, they're going to sail for five miles from the west side of the lake over to the east side of the lake. Now, Thankfully, uh, they've got some experienced sailors as disciples of Jesus. He's got many of his disciples are lifelong fishermen. Uh, they're most likely in one of their boats, and, and they know how to sail. They, they've spent most of their lives on these waters, in these boats. They know what they're doing. And so they're going to make this five-mile journey across the lake. And uh, this, this lake, uh, if you look at the Sea of Galilee, it's surrounded by mountains. It's, it's this valley surrounded by mountains, meaning there's all these different canyons around the lake where the wind could come in and the Sea of Galilee is below sea level. So as the winds come through these canyons and it dives down to the low pressure, all these storms can just happen really quickly, really instantly. It'd be similar to, to Missoula and what Lake Missoula used to be like, surrounded by mountains. And then you get the wind cutting through Hellgate Canyon and you just boom, out of nowhere, you're blasted by these high winds. This is often what happens in, in the Sea of Galilee. But they get on this boat, and Jesus says, let's get in this boat, in this lake, and let's sail all the way across. Important for us to note that this was Jesus' idea. But he gives them a destination. He gives them a direction. And he gives them a, a purpose, that we are going to this place with intention. He, he maps out for them what the next step is. Uh, we're going to come back together in the next episode of this, this series and see what happens on the other side of the lake. But Jesus has a mission. He has a purpose and he has a direction. And he doesn't give his disciples all of the information, but he says, we are going to the other side of the lake. He says, you guys are experienced. I'm just a carpenter. You guys are the sailors. So you, you take the reins. I'm tired. I'm going to go to sleep. And Jesus goes to sleep. It says, so they took Jesus in the boat and they started out leaving the crowds behind, although other boats followed. So the story starts with a beautiful scene. Uh, it, we're at the Sea of Galilee. The, the, the sun is setting. The stars are starting to come out and all these boats are starting to sail out into the middle of the lake and it's calm and it's beautiful. It's an amazing scene. The disciples, they're all hanging out in this boat together. Uh, history tells us that these fishing boats probably could hold a crew of 10 to 15 people. So they're not a canoe, but it's not a huge boat. And, uh, and if a wave was going to come and crash into it, it would probably have to be about 7 feet tall. So there's going to be some big waves in order to get into it. But all these guys, these 12 disciples and Jesus, are hanging out on this boat. And they're sailing across. Potentially they've uh, decided to let down their nets and do some fishing throughout the nights. And they're just kind of hanging out, relaxing. It's just them and Jesus. They're away from the crowds and they're watching the sunset and the stars come out. This is a beautiful scene that it starts with. Jesus falls asleep. But it says, suddenly, or all of a sudden, a, a, a fierce storm came up. High waves were breaking into the boat and it began to fill up with water. So picture this scene with me. 
They're out there. They're enjoying. Everything's smooth. It's calm. All of a sudden, there's a little breeze comes in, and, and they, they've experienced this before, most likely, growing up on the Sea of Galilee, but a wind starts, and so it's dark out, so they can't really read the weather, read the clouds, but the boat starts to, to rock a little bit. Finally, they decide this is getting kind of, kind of rough. Let's bring in the nets, and, and it's really starting to rock, so they're trying to strap down anything that they don't want to lose. Now waves are crashing in. This boat is, is intensely rocking. They're trying to hold on to the edge. They don't fly off. They're bumping into each other. Water's coming in. They're soaking wet. And they're, they're yelling at each other of who ought to do what with the boat and bring the sails down and make these adjustments. Like, all chaos breaks loose. All these grown men yelling and screaming and trying not to fall off of this boat as these huge waves are crashing in. The scene changes dramatically and quickly. All the while, Jesus is asleep in the back, on the stern. He's asleep. Through, through all of this, Jesus is asleep with his head on a cushion. First off, how tired is Jesus? <laughs> this is not a, a gentle rocking of the boat. I mean, water is filling the boat. These guys are, are whatever buckets they have. They're trying to throw water out. They're with their hands splashing it out. This isn't just, well, there's a little water. Maybe we should get it out. They think they're going to die. This is frantically scooping water out. They're doing whatever they can. And through all of the yelling, all of the waves, the boat filling up with water, Jesus is snoozing. You know he's not just gently sitting. He's sliding back and forth on the boat. He's banging into stuff. And he's still asleep. Like how tired is Jesus to sleep through all of this? You ever have one of those sleeps where you just sleep through all kinds of noise and chaos? Uh, it, it's, it's crazy. I was on an airplane recently and I was in the middle seat. And so you can't lean on the wall. But I, I was super tired. And so I just leaned my head on the chair in front of me at the tray table down and I just like leaned my head on the front and just fell asleep. And I don't know how long I was out but when I woke up uh, the guy next to me was like dude you missed all of that and I was like all of what? He was like whoa oh man the, the, the uh, pilot kept coming on telling us how this is the worst turbulence he's seen in a long time and, and we were going everywhere and everyone was freaking out. I was like are you serious? He's like yeah no I'm serious. I was like is he lying to me? Is he? No he's serious. I was like I, I didn't hear any of it. Uh, however, I did wait. When I woke up, I looked down at my tray table, and there was a pile of drool just right there. <laughs> that these people sitting next to me had just seen all this just dripping out for however long I was out. It was a great sleep. I was like, I don't, I don't even really care. I was gone. Like, it's, it doesn't matter. Deep sleeps are, are, are amazing. Maybe you've slept through some crazy stuff. Some of you slept through that massive earthquake we had last, last year, and I was like, I don't know how that happened. As, as a husband and as fathers, I think all husbands and fathers, somehow we develop this ability to sleep through the cries of babies. You've got to fake it for a while, but then it becomes real, and, and you sleep through the cries of babies. There's seriously times where I've like woken up in the morning like, wow, I slept great. Danny, that was awesome. Philly didn't get up at all. She's like, are you kidding me? He woke up 17 times. I haven't slept for five minutes. I was like, I had no idea. Like, I just, I, I really slept through it. Deep sleeps are, are amazing. Deep sleep is fantastic. But we see Jesus through all of this commotion, all of this chaos, and all of this fear, he stays asleep. Now I think what's important for us to notice is even though Jesus isn't active at the moment, he's resting, that Jesus isn't distant, he's just not as freaked out about the storm as they are. And I wonder how true this may be for you tonight. That just because Jesus isn't actively changing the circumstances that you're going through, it doesn't mean that he's distant. It may just mean he's not quite as freaked out about what's going on in your life as you are. That Jesus has already declared, we're going to the other side. I have purpose. I have direction. I have intention. Yeah, there may be some bumps in the road on our way to the other side, but because I know we're going to make it, I don't need to freak out the way that you guys are freaking out. I wonder how often we actually feel like God is distant. He is not aware of our circumstance. He's not aware of my storm. Well, all the while, Jesus, he's in the boat with you. He just isn't freaking out the way that we think he ought to. And it's because he knows the end of the story. He knows what lies ahead of you, and he knows it's okay to stay calm right now, that we're going to be all right. I already said where we're going. We don't need to freak out. But the disciples, they're, they're so panicked, it says they, they see him asleep, they, they're doing whatever they can to save themselves, and then they run to him in verse 38, and it says they ran up to him and woke him up shouting. So the disciples are officially yelling at Jesus. It is actually really important. They are officially yelling at Jesus. And this is what they yell at him. 
It says, teacher, don't you care that we are going to drown? Some translations say that we are perishing. We are in the act of dying. Not like this could be bad for us. It says, don't you care that we are currently dying? They yell this at Jesus. Saying, you brought us here. This was your idea and now you are inactive. You are sleeping. You don't seem to even care. And the disciples make this assumption that we as humanity have a tendency to make the same assumption. Maybe you here tonight have the tendency to make the same assumption. They assume that because there is a storm, the storm indicates that God doesn't care. That either God is distant or he doesn't care. That because I'm going through a storm, because I have circumstances that I wouldn't choose, because there is pain, because there is trial, because there is, is hurt in my life, because I'm in a storm, and if God is real, that must mean that he doesn't care. How often have you been that guy? How often have I been that guy? Where God, if if you are here, and yet you're allowing the storm to continue, you must not care. I want to tell you tonight that a life of following Jesus, being a disciple of Jesus, is a life of uncertainty. It's a life that includes storms. It's a life that you don't always know what's going on around you. A life following Jesus, being a disciple of Jesus, is not a life that is safe. Now your, your soul is safe, your eternity is secure, you, you're being held in the hands of our Father and you are going to be in heaven for eternity. Your soul is safe, but this life on this planet is, is not. I mean, just ask these disciples who all of them, as they follow Jesus, they go through so many trials and they all give up their lives and give up family members and go through imprisonments. Look at the Apostle Paul who who writes most of our New Testament, the times he was in chains and was beaten and the affliction that he went through. It was not a life of safety. You can look all throughout history, amazing men and women who have decided to be influential followers of Jesus. A life of influence is not a life of safety. That when you have purpose on your life, and God has direction for you, and He has, he has influence that He wants to use you for, it is not a life of, of safety, but it is not a boring life. If you are looking for a simple, boring, we're just going to make things easy, and I don't, I, I, don't know, I don't care if I ever have any influence, I just want to make it to the grave without anything crazy happening, you're following the wrong guy. Because following Jesus is not a life of safety. That following Jesus... There's going to be a lot of what is going on right now moments. Because Jesus, he he promised us life and he promised us life to the fullest. Life to the fullest is an adventure. It's crazy. It's scary. There's ups and downs. There's twists and turns and there's curveballs that you didn't expect. And it it is abundant. It is full. The following Jesus is a life that is is to the fullest. But what we see is the disciples in this moment, they allow themselves to focus more on the worst possible outcome than on the fact that Jesus was present with them in the midst of their storm. They became so distracted by the worst possible outcome, we are dying, and they forgot that they were in the presence of Jesus. They had forgotten that Jesus both loved them and brought them into this moment at the same time. That it wasn't one or the other. It wasn't he he loves us or he lets us go through a storm. That this is simultaneously Jesus loves them, has purpose for them, has a direction for them, has destination for them, and they are also in a storm. See, Jesus was in the boat and he had told them we're going to make it to the other side. But they let their circumstances, they let their storm sway their confidence in their Savior. When Jesus had told them, and they believed, we're going to get in this boat, this is relaxing, it's going to be enjoyable, we're going to get to the other side, we're going to see what Jesus has next for us. But when the storm arrived, they allowed their circumstances to sway their confidence in their Savior. And now rather than believing that there was hope in the days ahead, believing there was purpose on the other side of the lake, they are declaring, we are going to die. Promises of Jesus. I want to ask you tonight, what has Jesus promised you? For some of you, he's given you individual promises, but he has given promises to all of his followers. He says that when we find him, when we follow him, we find life. He says that in Jesus is the fullness of joy. It doesn't mean easy circumstances. It means joy in the midst of trial. 
We're promised that he has gone ahead to prepare a place for us. That the days ahead, the eternity ahead, ahead of us is going to be amazing. It says that when we find Jesus, we find freedom. And he who the sun sets free is free indeed. That he has promised us life and life everlasting. And it is so important for us to hold on to these promises, especially in seasons of storm. Especially when we are in circumstances that don't make sense. Because it is in the storms and it is on the other side of the storm that we find our faith growing. We find our faith maturing. We find the purpose of the storm. And so often we get so frustrated with the storm, we forget that there's purpose on the other side of the storm. It's like when Jesus went to the wilderness, the beginning of his ministry, he gets baptized, and he knows that his ministry is about to begin, and God is going to begin using him in powerful, powerful ways. But before he does, he goes to the wilderness for 40 days, and he doesn't eat anything, he doesn't drink anything, and he's got temptation coming at him. And this wasn't because he enjoyed days like that. It's because he knew the power on the other side of the wilderness. He knew what would be built inside of him on the other side of the storm. And he doesn't just know that about himself. He knows that about his disciples and he knows it about you and he knows it about me. I think so often we can have the same complaint like, you don't seem to care that I'm in this storm. And I wonder how often Jesus' reply is, no, I really do care. But I care enough about making you into the man and the woman that I promised you to become that I'm allowing you to go through this storm. Because on the other side, you're going to come out with so much greater faith, with so much greater vision, that the story that you develop, I'm going to use to, as influence and as impact in your community. And if you don't weather the storm, you don't get the story. If you don't weather the storm, you don't get the influence. You don't get the purpose. So yes, I care about you in the storm. And in fact, I care about you enough to let you go through the storm. Now there's clearly some storms in our lives that are a result of our own sinful decisions. That sometimes our storms are our own mistakes. But I believe that there are storms that are allowed. And even Jesus says, no, this is going to be good for you. And even though you seem, or it seems to you like I am distant or I don't care, I care about you enough to say, no, I see the years ahead of you. I see the marriage that you're going to have and the way that you're going to parent. And this is going to develop inside of you. You are going to come out the other side such a much more mature man and woman and husband and father and wife and sister and co-worker. Like this is going to develop inside of you who I've intended you to be says that they wake Jesus up. And in verse 39, it says that Jesus woke up and he rebuked. I love that those are the next two words. Anybody else wake up cranky? This is me right here. You wake up and you rebuke. I just love, it just brings me so much comfort. He woke up and he rebuked. I wake up cranky. I, I don't like waking up. It takes me a long time to, to get the grogginess out. Like I'm, I don't, I'm not a good person to, to wake up early. And, uh, and especially with kids, when they come and wake you up, it's just like, I, it's so easy to rebuke. Like, wake up and rebuke. Like, no, go away. Uh, I mean, if this was me, if I was Jesus and the disciples are waking me up, I think my response would be like, go ask your mother. Like, I mean, this is, this is the natural response where you get woken up by a child. Or if it's like, they, they say, hey, we got, a, we got a problem, we got a storm. It'd be like, okay, give me like five minutes, and then maybe I'll come out and fix your storm. Like, just let me wake up for a few minutes. This is how I am. If it were me, I would wake up and rebuke the disciples. Like, when my kids were like, hey, I'm hungry, I'm like, go get food. Like, it's out there in the kitchen. You know where we keep it. Just let me sleep. I mean, if they come to me, like, I'd be like, okay, awesome. Go calm your own storm. I'm tired. I'm sleeping. But he wakes up and he rebukes. But the beauty is, is he doesn't wake up and rebuke the disciples. It says he wakes up and he rebukes the wind. And he speaks to the waves. And he says, silence, be still. Suddenly the wind stops and there is a great calm. He rebukes the storm. Some of you tonight, you feel like, or what you have learned, is that if, if you approach God with a where are you, how could you let this happen? Do you even care? You feel like if you approach God with those questions that you will be rebuked. Maybe that's what religion has taught you. That you're not allowed to question. You're not allowed to be honest. That you can't have these thoughts and these worries and these concerns. Maybe you've had other people actually tell you, no, you can't say that. Maybe if you've grown up in the church, you felt the pressure to tell other people, no, 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 you can't say that. You can't ask that about God. Maybe you feel like he's going to rebuke you, but I love that Jesus speaks up and he rebukes, but he doesn't rebuke those that are asking, those that are calling out, those who are questioning him. He rebukes the wind and he rebukes the waves. 
I know sometimes you can feel guilty or you can feel bad about wondering if Jesus cares. That if you were in the same position as these disciples and you asked, do you even care what's going on in my life? I know that can make you feel bad because of the weight of religion. But I want to tell you tonight that I believe that if you have ever or even are currently wondering if Jesus cares, that that is actually a good indication that you're following Jesus because you care if he cares. In any of your relationships in life, that it is a good sign that you care if they care what you're going through. If you don't care what someone thinks about what you're going through, there is a problem or there is a non-existent relationship. But if you're wondering and you care if someone cares, that is a good sign that you have the right heart towards that person. And if you're here tonight, I want to free you from any weight of religion that says you can't feel that way. That if you care, if Jesus cares, that's a really good sign. And I also got good news. He does care. He does. But it's okay to ask. It's okay to wonder. It's okay for you to feel like, I don't know the future, but right now, what I'm going through, this circumstance, it doesn't seem like he cares. That doesn't make you bad. I'm so glad that you care if he cares. That it's okay to ask these questions. And we see that, that they go to Jesus. They say, you don't seem to care. And Jesus wakes up and he calms the storm. He fixes the circumstances for them. And what is amazing to me is as they come to Jesus and we look at the content of their prayer, if we consider prayer an honest interaction, a, a conversation with Jesus, what they yelled at him was a prayer. And if we look at the content of their prayer, it wasn't a, a request to calm the storm. They didn't come to him and they didn't say, okay, if we're going to get Jesus to be motivated to do what we want him to do, we need to articulate this in a really soft way. Okay, um, Jesus, uh, it's me. Um, I've tried to live really good today. I just was wondering if you would consider looking around. There's a big storm happening. I'm a little scared, even though I'm really scared. I think I'm going to die. Uh, I was wondering if uh, there's anything that you might be able to do. If it's in your will to, to fix this storm, do you think that you would have the opportunity? And they didn't do any of that. Look at the content of their prayer. They yell at Jesus. Don't you care that I'm dying? That's their prayer. And Jesus is okay with it. He doesn't rebuke them. He doesn't say, whoa, 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 whoa. No, you, you change your tone of voice. And then you come talk to me. He doesn't tell them, no, 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 those aren't the right words. There was no uh, dear heavenly father at the beginning. You didn't say amen. You, you didn't use your words properly. He doesn't respond in any of that way. They, they respond, they cry out to him, and Jesus takes it, and it actually works because it was actually real. I want to tell you that complaining can actually be a valid form of prayer. Probably shouldn't be your only form of prayer. But it can be a valid form of prayer. I mean, all you got to do is read the Psalms. Look at King David. A man after God's own heart. The vast majority of his songs that he writes are... God, why are you letting me go through this? Don't you even see me? Look at my enemies. I don't like them. Kill them. Save me. Kill them. Now, God doesn't respond to every complaint. He doesn't do everything that David asks. But God loves David's heart. He says, you're honest with me. You're real. You're not softening up your prayer life. And you, because you've learned to be honest with me, are a man after my own heart. I love that Jesus takes it. In 1 Peter, I think it's chapter 5, it says that we are to, to cast all of our cares on Jesus because he cares about you. Which is a great promise, but my favorite part of that whole sentence is the word cast. Because the word cast is demonstrative. It is, it is, it is a, a large verb. It's, it's not sit your cares at Jesus. It's not drop them. It's not let go of them. It's not slide them over so we can see them. It's, it's you need to chuck them, cast them. It is a big expression because he cares about you. That he's not asking you to be delicate. He's asking you to cast them. Yeah. That he's okay with this type of prayer. Yeah. And in fact, this type of prayer moves the heart of Jesus. Now again, picture this scene. They are just, they're bailing water out. They're fearful for their lives. 
They're, they're thinking of their families, their children that they may never see again. They're panicked. They're freaked out, bailing the water out. They run in desperation. They yell at Jesus. You don't seem to care. Don't you see? This is the end of the road for us. It's all over. And Jesus stands up and, and, and he rebukes the wind. And all of a sudden, just it's calm. And the boat is slowly rocking. And they've got water dripping off their beards and, and running down their legs. And, and Jesus is, is standing there. He's got a little bit of bedhead going on. Maybe wipes, wiping some crusties out of his eyes. <laughs> and they're all just, and everything's all of a sudden calm. And they're breathing heavy. They got their hands on their knees because they were just working so hard, trying to catch their breath. Their adrenaline is at a maximum. They just thought they were going to die. And in a moment, everything changed. And there's this calm. There's this peace. There's this pause. And Jesus, once it's calm, it says that he looks at his disciples. He scans all 12 of them. And he asks them, he says, why are you afraid? Even after all that you've seen, even after all that we've done, he says, you still have no faith. So what happened to your faith? Where did your faith go? Now as I was looking at the story, these disciples, they've seen Jesus move in so many ways. If you've been here for this series, this is uh, almost our 40th message on, on the This Man series. And we've seen so many times that Jesus has moved. We've seen healings. We've seen the casting out of demons. We've seen the water turn to wine. We've seen a young boy who was dead brought back to life at the touch of Jesus. Uh, we, we've seen amazing, amazing miracles. And the disciples have walked through every single one of them. And they get excited when, when a lame person or a leper gets brought to Jesus. And they're excited that they know Jesus has the power, has the ability to save and to forgive and to heal. But as far as I've been able to study and, and uh, what the Gospels have given us, this is the very first encounter where it was the disciples and it was Jesus who was in need of a miracle. This is the first time that they were actually in the place where they were the ones on their deathbed. This may be the first time that they ever saw themselves in need of a miracle. Have you ever noticed that it's a lot easier to speak life and faith into somebody else's situation, into somebody else's storm? How much easier it is to see someone who's going through a trial or, or, or a struggle or an issue or a pain or a loss of job or, or a strained romance. And it's so easy to, to speak to them and say, no, God is with you. God is for you. He knows what he's doing. He's not forgotten you. He's not forsaken you. He's got plans to prosper you. It's so easy to say that, that he who started a work in you is going to finish it, that it's not over, that you are loved, that you are accepted. It's so easy to speak life into other people's storms. But how hard is it when you're in the storm? To speak that same life to yourself. To actually believe that now that I'm the one in need, where does my faith go? These disciples are walking through that. They've had faith on the behalf of others, but they need to come to the realization that if God can do this for them, do I believe that he can do it for me? And Jesus, he does question them about their faith. But what I love, the beauty of Jesus' character is he calmed the storm first. He didn't let them off the hook about their lack of faith, but his grace went first. He didn't make them endure past calling out to him for help. He didn't turn at them and say, you guys have no faith. Wake me up once you've established some real faith, and then I'll do something. He, he answers on their behalf. He shows grace first, but then he does challenge them on their, on their lack of maturing faith. He says, guys, you, you got to have greater faith in this. i got so much purpose for your future. There's so many amazing ways I want to use you. This is the first of many storms that you're going to walk through. And guys, you you got to develop a faith that I'm not just for everybody else, but I'm for you. That I don't just love everybody else, I love you. I'm not just with everybody else, I'm with you. He says, you got to have faith, not just for others, but faith that I love you. And he challenges the maturing faith. And then verse 41, where we end tonight, says the disciples at this point, they're absolutely terrified. Who is this man, they asked each other, that even the wind and the waves obey him. So we find him at the end of the story, still fear his transition from the storm to now the awe and the power of Jesus. They're just terrified about how powerful Jesus is. 
Maybe my favorite part about the story where we end tonight is that these disciples, they discovered a new view of Jesus that they had never seen before. They thought they knew Jesus. It's difficult to determine how far along in their journey with Jesus this was. They walked with him for three years. Likely this is over a year of walking with Jesus. And they are the closest human beings on this planet to Jesus. They've walked with him every day. They've seen every miracle. They've heard every teaching. They've seen his love, his heart, his compassion. They've seen him challenge the religious leaders. They've walked through all of this. And if anybody on earth knew Jesus, it was these guys. They thought they knew him. But what we see at the end of the story is them standing back, completely blown away that they don't really know who he is. They say, you guys, this, we've been walking with him for a year, but who is this man? We've never seen this before. We've seen him do a lot of things, but this is different. We've seen him save a lot of other people. We've seen him perform miracles on the behalf of others. But we just witnessed him do a miracle on our own behalf. They thought they knew Jesus, but they were blown away once again. I believe that the more you experience Jesus, the more you realize you don't really know him that well. If you've been following Jesus for a while, You've probably discovered, as, as I have, that you think you know a lot about the character of Jesus. And then you go through a storm, or you go through a circumstance, or, or you see his provision, or, or you, you see uh, what he's doing in the lives of others, or the, what he's doing in your church, or what he's doing in your children. And all of a sudden, there's these moments where you're just like, I, I have no idea how good he is. I thought I knew him, but now I'm not really sure. And I think there's this weird weight of religion that makes us feel like we're supposed to know. Or we got to at least give the impression like we've got Jesus figured out. We know what this Christianity thing is. We know what it means to follow Jesus. We know what it means to be like him. And we can make all these black and white rules saying, no, this is who Jesus is and how we ought to live. But I think the more you follow Jesus, the looser you hold on to what's black and white. And you realize, I just don't even really know how good he really is. Man, I thought I experienced his grace, but after I blew it that bad, after I did what I thought I would never do again, and he still loves me, and he's still using me, man, I, I guess I didn't know how good he was. Yeah. These disciples have this amazing moment of seeing that he's so much bigger, his love is so much greater than they'd ever witnessed before. These are amazing moments in our own lives where we get to realize how Jesus carried us through certain storms. We didn't think we were going to find the other side. And when we did, we thought it would be something we'd be so ashamed of. But now God is using my storm to help other people. And it's like, wow, God, you, you actually knew what you were doing. I questioned you. I didn't know why I was there. I was frustrated that you let this happen. But wow, you loved me enough. And you love these other people in my life enough to give me this experience to be influential. You're better than I thought. I began to think, as frustrated as we can get with our storms, I began to think this week, like how many storms did Jesus navigate us away from that we'll never recognize he did it? How many times has he saved me from a storm? And because I, don't rec I, I never went through it, I never even recognized that he did it. How many days has he kept my, my lungs working and my heart going and my brain working? And how many relationships and conversations and, and opportunities does he just bring into my life every single day? And I don't even recognize it's him. But when I begin to think about it, it's like, whoa, you're better than I thought. You're so much better than I've given you recognition for, than I've given you credit for. Now picture this again. Everything is calm. Jesus doesn't say if he goes back to sleep. If he's anything like me, he definitely does. He gives them a one-sentence challenge. It's like, guys, where's your faith? Conversation over. Jesus goes back, probably curls back up to get a little more sleep. It's pitch black out. There's now a calm sea again. And as Jesus curls up, the disciples are standing there in shock. They're standing there in awe. You can just see them just looking at each other like, what just happened? And then they look at Jesus. 
And they have this moment where they're so taken aback by this man that they just look at each other in the eye and someone speaks up first and says, you guys, he's better than we thought. He's better. We thought we knew him. We've seen him do amazing things. I was a big fan of him before, but he's even better than I thought. I don't know what your opinion of Jesus is tonight. How good of an opinion, how low of an opinion you have. I'm going to tell you whatever your opinion of Jesus is tonight. He's better than that. When's the last time you had a moment like these disciples? We're actually stopped complaining about your storm and you actually looked at the man and you're just taken aback. Man, you're better than I thought. I look around and sure I would choose some things differently in my life, but look what you've done. When I was freaked out, I had no faith that I was going to make it through this storm and you took care of it for me. You're, you're better than I thought. My hope and my prayer tonight is that we would each have a moment of looking at Jesus. And again, regardless of what kind of opinion you brought in here tonight of him, if you look at him for just a moment, you leave realizing he's, he's better than I thought. The beauty of Jesus is that his love is so high and it's so vast that there's no way our human minds can ever, ever comprehend it, that every time we look at Jesus, we'll be taken aback. Like He's, he's better than last time I looked. And then we look again, he's like, I don't know how, but he's even better now. He is grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. And every experience in life that I have and that you have, whether it is good or it is bad, on the other side we see Jesus, that he carried us through it. And we realize, I thought he was good before, but he's even better today. He's even better now. And I think sometimes it takes a storm for us to be reintroduced to his grace again. I think sometimes the storm is allowed because we've forgotten how good he was. Or we've gotten comfortable with how good we think he is. Sometimes the storms in your life are just Jesus waking you up a little bit. Be like, hey, hey, I'm better. Look back at me, I'm better. Whatever you're doing in your life, whatever you think is fulfilling you, I'm, I'm better. And sometimes it's it's the uneasiness of our lives that causes us to run back to him and when we run back to him and he hears us and he's with us and he loves us our only response is just like these disciples to look around and be like guys I don't know what just happened I thought I knew him but I guess I don't I guess he's better than I could have ever imagined I'm gonna ask Spencer and Linnea if you guys will join me and would the rest of you would you just stand with me Father, I just sense you in this room so strong tonight. Jesus, I believe that you, you are here tonight to speak and to challenge and to love and to encourage individuals' lives here tonight. Holy Spirit, I sense that you are, you're at work. Not just through words that have been spoken through a microphone, but you are at work individually loving and speaking to the hearts of your kids here tonight. Lord, we ask in these last moments that we have together that we would be responsive to you. That we would engage with the opportunity that you're setting before us. Church, you may be here tonight and you're in a storm. I may not know you. I may not know your storm. I may not know what the wind and the waves represent in your life. But I do know who has power over them. And to know that he's not distant. Although it may seem like he's not active. He's in the boat. And he can handle your honesty tonight. He can handle a prayer that's not delicate. He's not asking you to formulate your prayers and your cries to him in a way that sounds nice. Truth is, he already knows your thoughts. He knows your hearts. Why try to disguise them in clever words? 
He knows. And He can handle your honesty. And as we look at this story, I love to see what did the disciples do to get this result. Now to be clear, it was Jesus and only Jesus, the power of Jesus, the love of Jesus, the word of Jesus that calmed the storm. But I think there's value in seeing what part the disciples played. What we see they did in their frantic state, even though there was a lack of faith, what they finally did is they took their eyes off the storm and they ran to Jesus. That's all they did. With a really honest, inaccurate prayer. But it was all Jesus was looking for. And we see in this moment that Jesus gives up his rest so they could have it. I want to tell you this is the gospel. This is the essence of the message of Jesus. That he gave up his rest so that undeserving humanity could take it. He gave up his position so that undeserving, unfaithful humanity, you and me, can receive it. It's a gift that's available to you tonight and every single day. And when you take your eyes off of your storm, you say, Jesus, this is honestly where I'm at right now. He exchanges his rest for you to tell you tonight that Jesus is here. He's in your boat. He's not far. And He cares. Whatever you think of Him, He's better. Now Spencer and Linnea lead us in one last song. I'm going to ask our, our prayer team to just move right up here. You guys can even move right now. Here's how we're going to end. As they sing this song, if you feel like you want to sing along with them, that's fine. But more importantly than singing along, is you having a conversation with Jesus. I believe that you can have this conversation right in your seat, but I also believe that there is so much power in responding to what's going on on the inside. There's power in coming up and praying with someone else who, who's got faith and joining together with you and contending with you and, and, and taking your needs to God with you. So we're going to open up a time of prayer. Maybe you're here tonight and maybe tonight's your night to just follow Jesus for the first time. Maybe you you see the grace and the love of Jesus like you've never seen before and tonight's your night to say Jesus I'm, I want to learn what it means to follow you I warn you it's not a safe life but it's the best life it's a life of purpose it's a life of hope it's a life of joy it's a life of intentions if that's you tonight man, we would love to pray with you again you can do it right from your seat that God doesn't need you to meet with one of us he knows what's going on in your heart but we would love to pray with you We'd love to, to celebrate with you. Maybe you're here tonight and you want someone to join you in prayer for the honesty that's in your heart. And we'd love to do that. We're not going to embarrass you. We're just going to simply ask you, what's your name? How can I pray for you tonight? If you just stay in your seats, if you don't come forward for prayer, again, that's amazing. God hears you and he sees right where you're at. But would you take this moment to have the most honest prayer you've had with Jesus in a while? I think tonight for some of you, the message he wanted you to hear is just let me have it. Cast your cares. I care about you. You don't have to worry. You don't have to be delicate. I'm kind of the God of the universe. I can handle your words. He wants you to know that he loves you, that he's near, and he's better than you thought. Jesus, we thank you right now for your presence. We thank you that you're better than anything that we've ever thought about you. You're better. Even the highest opinion of you in this room, you're better than that. Thank you that we get to spend the rest of our days and the rest of eternity continually looking at you and you are always better than the last time that we looked. Got to think that heaven will just be us obsessing over how much greater you seem to be. That, that we just see you and we're blown away day after day after day for all of time of how good you are. Father, I again pray that our hearts right now are open, receptive. Lord, that we would be honest with you tonight. That we would come to you with our cares, our concerns. 
Father, I pray that those of tonight are, are having this, this conversation with themselves and uh, deciding if this is a night to start this journey of following you. Lord, just reveal again how much you love them, how much purpose you have for them, how much joy, God, that you reveal to them that although it's not a safe life, that it is everything that they've been looking for. Tonight will be the night of salvation. Tonight will be the night where they are forgiven. They're set free. And they walk out of here with a new spring in their step, with a new vision for their life, and a new love from you. Father, we love you and we worship you tonight. In your name we pray. Amen. I want to encourage you, if we can join you in prayer, just tell the person next to you, you need to scoot through. They're going to let you. It's going to be awesome. But we would love to join you up here in prayer. We'll dismiss in just a moment. But let's worship and let's talk to God for a few minutes.